，好，呃，职场英文，相信你们都知道，就是给大四学生上的基础英文课。我的名字是徐景顺，严武许，我其实是应英系的老师，呃，就是被派来支援。教就是全校性的英文课程，我课程的网页设计基本上就是你所有需要的资讯都会放在 Moodle 上面，所以如果你哪一天没办法来，或是不想来，啊，或是呃必须要透过线上上课的话，呃，所有需要的东西都在线上，所以我们今天先我先带你们看这个网页设计。呃，然后再简单说明一下这门课会怎么进行。嗯，但第一个要讲的就是你们第三节课的实习课也是我，所以虽然按学校规定我们必须要换教师换到 CC 洞去，但是课程规划上面呃没有差别，我就把它当做三节课的英文课。好，所以我们来看一下 Moodle。嗯、um, ，首先就是我的 email， 如果你需要联系我的话，可以用 Teams 联系我，也可以寄信给我。如果你去点我的 Moodle 账号，它上面给的信箱跟这个不一样，那个信箱是假的，没有用。寄过去的话，他会回信跟你说就是没人收，所以需要寄信给我的话，请寄到这一个信箱。再来是 Microsoft Teams 的编码，如果因为某一些奇怪的原因你没有被加进去，需要进去，然后不想等学校加你的话，你可以用这个编码把自己加进去。好，再来是课纲，就是课程进度的部分。好，呃，进度是这样，我们会用这本课本，学校就是统一指定课本，它里面有七个单元，期中考会考二三四，期末考会考五六，所以这就是我们上课的内容。上半学期，呃，第一周放假，第二周，呃，跟你们介绍一下我们课程设计，就是我现在正在做这件事。啊、呃，然后今天应该介能够介绍完，所以我们直接开始上第二单元。呃，然后到了期中考之前就把二三四上完。期中考之后呢，我们就上五六，然后应该也也可以上的完，会多一点时间。那多出来的时间，我们就可以回头把第一单元以及后面的第七单元也也看能不能把它上完。但那个就比较没有进度压力了。那第十五周，十二月十六号，我们看电影。那一天我不在，我那天早上另外有事，所以我会，嗯，我会再挑一天补课，嗯，那进度就就是看电影。所以如果补课时间你没办法来的话，呃，你的就是，呃、嗯，学习进度不会受影响。那补课日期我之后就是选定了跟你们讲，但如果你可以来的话，还是鼓励你们来一起看电影。首先，呃，我蛮会挑电影的，然后再来就是因为有巡堂老师，如果只有我一个人坐在那边的话，会有人问问题，所以如果可以来的话，就鼓励你们尽量来，会有中文字幕了。对啊，然后第十八周同一期末考，这个进度可以吗？有想问的吗？好，那接下来就是讲课本，这边课本就是这本，呃，学校编的第七册是这样的、啊，我把每一个单元都扫描好了，然后有都上传到 Moodle 去，所以你不想买的话，可以不要买课本。但是买课本有诸多好处，首先就是里面有很多练习题，如果你针对电子档去做的话，你又要另外找一张纸啊，然后到时候整理不知道放哪去了，容易搞丢啊什么的
，然后再来就是所有需要用到的内容都在同一本书，非常方便。呃，我在 Moodle 上面是按单元分，就是每一个单元一个 PDF， 所以就是档案很多啦，可能也是容易搞乱啦，临时需要不知道在哪里打什么的。第三个优点是，呃，为了节省档案空间，我的扫描品质未必非常的清楚。我有，我是尽量的，我不是用手机拍，我是真的找一台扫描机，嗯、呃，但是它总是没有就是纸本来的清楚。所以如果这部分你很在乎的话，也鼓励你买一本课本。那当然就是有些同学可能看电子书对眼睛比较疲劳。比较不呃，愿意比较想看纸本，也鼓励你买一本。然后呃，冬天很冷，需要柴火的话，课本比较好烧。嗯、呃，那课本订购是这样的，一本两百五，但是如果可以超过二十本的话，价价格会呃会打八折，一本两百。所以我等一下下课期间或是。等一下会找一段时间统计一下有谁想要买课本，然后看能不能就是冲到二十本，然后给大家打个小折扣这样子。所以你们可以稍微考虑一下要不要买。好，然后再来参考资料这边这个网址是学校帮大家整理一些有用的英文学习资源。相信大家读到大四的都知道英文课不能。呃，英文能力不能只靠英文课培养出来，呃，所以鼓励大家课余时间有有空的话，可以利用这个连接上面的资源，或者自己找一些资源继续练习你们的英文能力。听说明传有呃英文相关的毕业门槛，对不对？对，所以这个也是呃各位可以用来准备的一些资源。好，然后下面是分数，分数呃配分的部分，平时成绩占百分之五十，呃，基本上就是要来上课了。期中考占百分之二十，期中考的内容是有听力题跟阅读题，期末考占百分之三十，期末考内容有听力阅读，呃，占期末考的百分之呃。所以期末考是百分之三十，其中二十趴是听力阅读，然后最后十趴是写作，所以期末考要考写作。我等一下要带你们看题型。好，所以配分长这个样子，有有疑问吗？好，嗯、呃，其中期末都要考听力，这也是为什么呃课程讲解完之后，我们实际开始上课会以英文为主。就是听力一样，就是练习机会越多，呃，听的越顺，然后能够听懂的也越多。好，我们回到 Moodle 去。接下来这个区块是，如果我有什么事情要临时通知你们的话，我会在这边贴公告。那在这边贴公告呢 ，Moodle 就会寄信到各位的学号信箱。啊，我知道不是每个人都会看学号信箱，所以我同时也会公告在 Teams 里面。嗯，我我当然会尽量就是利用课堂时间宣布了。那有时候就是突然事情临时有变卦或者什么的，就要一定要呃即刻通知的话，就会贴在这里。所以如果你没有查看学号信箱、学校信箱的习惯的话，建议你们每个礼拜至少上来这边看一下，或是上 Teams 看有没有张贴什么事。但就是如果定期去看学校信箱会比较好了。好，这个东西这个 PDF， 嗯，用英文上课其实除了培养听力之外，还有一个优点，我每一堂课会录影，然后之后会上传 YouTube， 然后把 YouTube 连接贴到 Moodle 上面。所以你们如果要复习的话，可以重新呃再聆听一遍，就是课堂内容。那。课堂英内容用英文上的优点是这样子 ，YouTube 影片会自动上字幕，自动生成的，就是电脑 AI 呃配字幕。这个还好，因为我们到时候用 Teams 的话，我也会就是让 Teams 生成字幕。重点是 YouTube 字幕可以搜寻，你可以在 YouTube 的呃影片那边可以开启文逐字
稿、文字记录。嗯、呃，这边跟你讲，给你看点哪里呃秀出来，它会在像右边这样子打开来。那因为它在画面上，所以你可以用 Control F 去搜寻那个字幕内容。也就是说，如果你只想听影片的某一个部分，你你就不用从头找到尾，你可以搜寻关键字，点下去，然后影片直接跳到你要去的地方。呃，所以这个如果你需要这样的功能的话，可以自己就是看一下这个 PDF 的画面，跟着操作。好，接下来我们来看其中期末题型。呃，我们是 PEP one。Practical English for Professionals. 期中考听力阅读，期末考，呃，它虽然是说第五、第六单元，但是它下面有打信号说包含整个学期的所有单元，所以其实它期末考的内容是二到六，不是五到六。所以期中考考完，请不要把东西就是全部忘光，还需要再用一遍。好，呃，然后这边看一下，呃，好提醒就是刚刚讲说，其中是听力加阅读，期末的话，听力阅读，然后写作，写作是什么呢？要写一篇 email reply， 所以提干会给你一封信，或是可能会描述一封 email 给你看，呃，让你了解，然后要你写一封 email 去回，呃，提干提供的内容。这个通常是商业书信往来，联系就是送货啦，或是日期呃要敲定啊什么之类的。对，所以让你们有点心理准备。我们呃学期中也会有几次练习的时间，所以目前不用太紧张。快考试了，你再开始紧张还来得及。接下来呃。Key vocabulary， 这个是我们课本里面，呃，最后面非常贴心的帮我们总整理整本课本的所有单字，我就把它扫描上去了。嗯，但是它没有定义，没有解释，它只有第几单元以及它的词性，名词、动词、形容词、副词。嗯。但至少有帮你整理出来，所以呃，当我们在上课一路上下来的时候，你可以留意这些单字。呃，接下来这是期中考区，呃，你不用管它，这个单纯只是我输入成绩的地方。我算成绩的方式是呃，交给 Moodle 去算，我自己就是英文老师数学很差，交给电脑。那这个对你们而言也有一个优点，你们随时可以上 Moodle 点成绩这一块。去看目前你们的成绩多少？呃，我是老师，我每一个人都看得到，但你们应该就是只是看得到自己那一列，你会看到平时成绩、期中成绩、期末成绩、学期总成绩。我调的方式是这样的，就是总成绩就是 A 加 B 加 C， 它是简单加总，也就是说平时成绩你们这边显示最高分就是五十分。其中成绩最高分二十分，期末成绩最高分三十分，这样了解吗？所以你随时想要了解呃你们的成绩状况，可以上来追踪一下。对，然后这个就是呃接下来 practice email writing one， 这个是学校非常贴心提供给我们的那个。期末写作题目的范例题，所以你看他这边有跟你讲是什么状况，下面给你一封信，呃，一封 email， 然后呃，写作的题目就是要你去回这封信。好，所以你们自己有空可以上来看一下。啊，我们之后。也会花一点时间，呃，带你们练习。接下来，这是我输入期末考成绩的地方，这是我输入平时成绩的地方。这三块那个成绩区块，你们目前都看不到，我把它隐藏起来了。好，然后呢，我们课本还有一个，还有一个页面是，呃，提醒你们说
，如果你人在国外，然后被外国人搭讪，要跟他聊天的话，有哪些策略可以考虑？有哪些剧情也许会用得到？那虽然这不会是考试的一部分，但是我想，呃，你们。明年此时应该已经进入社会了，也许这个会用到，也许对你们有帮助。好，然后接下来每一个单元的内容也都放上来了。PDF 是课本内容 ，PowerPoint 是呃，英教中心有提供的课本内容，但是我觉得它整理的未必非常的美观，呃，所以看你们方便看 PDF 还是 PowerPoint。都可以，但是如果上课需要看的话，我会用 PDF。啊，接下来就是每一个单元的听力档也都放上来了。我们基本上也会花时间在课堂上去做听力。那如果你想复习的话，你可以自己上木头去下载来听。所以第二单元、第三单元、第四单元、第五单元、第六单元。好，那另外呢，呃，每一个单元的 PowerPoint 它有附。呃，影片就是当年印教中心找了一些学生来演一些常见的场合，然后课本就有配合的练习题，就是这个 PDF 档。那影片都在 YouTube 上面都有，所以我直接就填那个 YouTube 连接。我们之后有空也会来观看，然后做练习题。那一样，如果你自己想练习，也都在这里。然后最下面就是第一单元、第七单元，你会发现，哎，怎么只有 PDF？ 其他东西的，呃，印教中心目前没有提供，所以这两个单元，呃，到时候上的时候，我还会持续跟学校看能不能要到呃 PowerPoint 跟听力档跟影片，但要不到的话也没关系，我们就单纯就是上阅读跟写作的部分。好，呃，所以课程目录网页有想提问吗？好，嗯，这门课是已经都读到大四的英文课，相信你们有充分的就是英文课的上课经验。嗯，我这边就是想简单提醒几种学习策略，呃，因为毕竟。英文是个语言，它不是一个有既定范畴的技术或是知识。尤其英文这个语言，相较于嗯、呃、不是世界通行语言的嗯、呃、其他语言，更是学习上会有各种困难。呃，相信你们都知道，英文很多规则是呃例外比规则还多。呃，这也是因为英文是世界语言，它基本上。跑到哪里就会吸收那边的人的语言习惯跟文化思维，然后就变成一个非常多元的语言。所以学英文其实只有一种方式，要用观察的。我可以就是花一整个学期跟你们讲各式各样的文法规定，然后各种单字。我们到时候也会讲很多文法跟单字，但是你把这些全部背下来，你把整个字典吞下去。都不如你平常在使用英文的时候，你特别去留意，呃，尤其是母语人士，不只是他们说什么，不只是他们写什么，而且他们如何去说，如何去写。所以，呃，看一篇文章，当然先了解它内容是什么，然后你也可以抓一些生字。那之后你就可以留意说，哎，他表达这样的概念，他是用什么样的方式表达？他句型首尾强调的是什么？他如何承上启下，然后背后呃这样的写作策略反映的是什么样的思维？嗯、um, ，大家应该也都有就是中学时代练国文作文的经验嘛？啊、uh, 啊、uh, ，不晓得你们有没有观察到，就是用中文写学生作文，跟用英文写学生作文那个逻辑其实不大一样。中文，呃，国文老师通常会跟你讲说，要迟早华丽啊，要排比啊，要对称啊，什么什么什么的。英文刚好相反，呃，作为世界通行语言，英文强调的是清楚明白。你如果通篇下来都是最简单的主词、动词、受词、句型，只要清楚都 OK， 看得懂就好。英文对于
，写作美感的强调不在于单一句子或是用字华丽，它强调的是你的结构非常清楚，你下一句能够预测上一句读完之后读者想看到什么。嗯、um, ，有点像是当你看一部电影的时候，呃，如果它的剪接非常顺畅，你根本注意不到。基本上，你想看到下一个画面是什么，他立刻就给你了。英文的写作就是这样子，能够了解你的读者想看什么，想读到什么内容，然后下一句立刻就给他。所以，写很好的英文文章，尤其是尤其是工具性的，像商业书信这种文章，写最好的是你根本没有发现哪里有特别亮点，因为整篇都非常通顺，然后呢，该传达的意思也都传达的很清楚。读者读完之后没有疑问，嗯，那能够进步到这个境地，就只能靠观察。因为如果你要预测你读者想了解什么，代表说你要了解你的读者，了解你读者意思就是说你要能够知道人家的想法是什么，他在乎的是什么，啊、嗯，然后处理一件事情，他的思维逻辑会是怎么样的。这个一切都要用观察来的。你即使抓一个母语人士访问他，访问个老半天，他大概也说不出来。你只能从，呃，一般英文母语人士的说话跟写作逻辑来归纳出来。所以这就为什么各种英文老师跟英文课程都一直强调要多练习，要多花时间，课堂以外的时间，在家的时间，休闲时间，零碎时间。因为你接触越多，只要你接触的。的期间都有在观察留意，这样子的英文才会进步。这样可以吗？好，所以这也会是我们这门课的呃精神之一。我还是会像传统英文老师给你讲解单字文法，但是借由呃英文的课堂进行，然后就是去 run 很多就是课本的活动，让你们处。处于那个用英文去思考的一个状况之中。啊，我每次排课的时候都用就是英文上课的速度在排，所以我中文上课比英文快三倍。所以 course introduction 上完了。对于以上说明，你们有想提问或是讨论什么环节吗？好、okay, ，if that's the case， 呃、uh, ，then let's jump directly into unit two。Testing one two。Okay。Um, so you don't have a textbook yet, so let's take a look at the PDF scan. So unit two is about studying abroad. How to get there and what to do when you are overseas. 呃、uh, ，Now, as I said, it's important to not just memorize the words and the grammar, but to really try to uh, think about this content using English. And so, every unit begins with some warm-up questions to get you to think about. <laughs> to think about the kinds of ideas that are related to this unit.、Um, so, I'm going to read these questions, and you can think about、uh, them. You don't have to answer,、uh, but it's to help you prepare for the unit. Question one: Have you ever thought of studying abroad? 
where would you study? What would you study? Do you know anyone who has studied abroad or anyone who is preparing to study abroad? Have they shared their experience with you? How would you find out about studying abroad? And how would you pay for studying abroad? Study abroad. Let's take a look at this article. By the way, I'm sure you all know that the textbook is very old. The textbook was uh, first printed in. It was a long time ago. Um, but the point is that many of the ideas related to technology and the Internet may not be very current. Um, so some of it may feel a bit outdated, but the general ideas still make sense. So let's take a look at this. Uh, article about studying abroad. Studying abroad can mean many things to many different people. Generally, we think of study abroad as something for university students, but there are programs for business people, families, teenagers, and married couples. Almost anyone in any age group and education level can study abroad. While university study is the most popular and well known type of study abroad, students can study foreign languages and culture, participate in sports and recreation, join nature programs, even study cooking. There's something for everyone. University study is the most popular type of study abroad. Approximately 586,323 foreign students enrolled in American universities and colleges during the 2002-2003 academic year, a 0.6% increase from the previous year. The number of foreign students attending school in the United States has steadily increased every year. This trend reflects increasing globalization and interdependence between countries and economies. In addition to wanting an international education to meet future professional demands and opportunities, students also expressed a desire to meet others and gain a greater understanding of other cultures. India, China, and Korea are the top three countries, sending a combined 179,093 students to the United States. Taiwan ranks fifth in U.S. international student enrollment, with 28,017 students attending graduate schools, undergraduate programs, and non-degree or ESL programs. ESL means English as a second language. So it is a English While the majority of Taiwan's 48,103 students who studied abroad in 2002 went to the US, other popular destinations included the United Kingdom, Australia, and Japan. In 2002, 
7,583 students attended programs in the UK and 2,397 attended programs in Australia and 1,696 studied in Japan. The most popular majors for foreign students in the United States are business and management, engineering, math and computer sciences, or one of the social sciences. In addition to overseas Chinese attending programs in Taiwan, a steadily increasing number of foreign students have been coming to Taiwan as well. In 2002, 6,380 foreign students enrolled in programs in Taiwan. The most popular topics with 6,157 students were the humanities, mainly Chinese language. Most of Taiwan's foreign students are Asian. The Japanese were the largest group studying in Taiwan with 1,521 students, followed by 1,158 Indonesian students and 1,038 Korean students. Americans had the highest enrollment from Western countries with 790 students. Canada was second with 250 students attending programs in Taiwan. American students are also participating in study abroad programs in record numbers. During the 2002 academic year, 160,920 students went abroad to study, a 4.4% increase from the previous year. The most popular destinations for American students were the United Kingdom, Italy, and Spain. American students preferred programs in social sciences and humanities, business and management, and foreign languages. Study abroad programs provide a valuable educational opportunity, but beyond the obvious educational benefits, Participants can exchange cultural information and become understanding and tolerant of other cultures. As these students return to their home countries and take positions in business and government, future business and diplomatic relations may be enhanced. Study abroad programs do more than educate individuals they may affect future relationships between countries. How so it, wait, OK, so after reading through one time, you now have a general idea of what this article is talking about. Let's start to examine its writing strategy. How, uh, what does each paragraph mean and how uh, do it does it organize its ideas? So the title is study abroad. Everything in this article should be related to studying abroad. But this title is very short. It doesn't tell us what kind of information this article will give us. If you want to talk about studying abroad, there are many different kinds of information. We have seen that this article gives a lot of math and numbers and statistics, Tongji. But another article that focuses on personal experience studying abroad could also have the same title. This title could also be applied to 
an article about government policies related to studying abroad. And there are other kinds of articles that could also use this title. So if you find yourself writing something in English, it's always a good idea to be a bit more specific in your title to help prepare your reader for the article itself. The same applies to writing emails. For example, if you're writing an email um, asking if I can give you a higher grade, the subject of your email, if you only say teacher help. I don't know what you're going to say. But if you say teacher, can you help improve my grades? Then I will be prepared to read your email and reject your request. Maybe uh, it depends on the situation. Um, so what could be a better title? for this article. Do you have ideas? We know that the focus is on the number of people. So uh, the easiest thing to add would be study abroad dash Pozaha. How many people? Right, very clear. Um, maybe you want to use the title to let your reader know that this article will only be about the numbers and will not have personal experience. So maybe you can call this study abroad by the numbers. Um, but the point is to try to be a bit more specific in your title to give a bit more information at the very beginning to help your reader. The first paragraph, first sentence, studying abroad can mean many things to many people. So uh, the first sentence tells us that maybe the article will talk about the different ways that you can study abroad, or if you study abroad, the different things that you can learn. Indeed, the first paragraph talks about the different kinds of people their different backgrounds and the different things that they study abroad. So if you are looking for information and you discover this article, the first sentence can tell you whether or not this paragraph will be useful to you. So instead of reading the whole paragraph, you can simply read the first sentence, maybe the second sentence, and the last sentence, and you can have a good idea of what this paragraph is talking about. That's good English writing. Uh, English loves to give you the important information first. In Chinese, we call this 开门见三法. 我自己读高中的时候，我写中文作文，每一篇都是开门见山，我只会这招。英文太强了，所以中文写作能力。The second paragraph, first sentence, university study is the most popular type of study abroad. So this tells us that this paragraph will be about university students studying abroad. But it also tells us that uh, this article may use the structure of different kinds of studying abroad. 
Uh, now, in, in the case of this article, that's not exactly true. University study turns out to be the basically the only thing that this article talks about. So the second paragraph gives us general information about university students studying abroad. It talks about American universities um, and the number of people in the past few years uh, to start to give us a sense of what kind of information is in this article. If when you read the first paragraph, you're still not quite sure what kind of article this is. By the time you read the second paragraph, you can be pretty sure that this will be an article filled with numbers. Paragraph three. India, China, Korea. So this paragraph, it looks like, will be about where people come from when they go to study in the United States. Paragraph four. Uh, starts with the sentence, the majority of Taiwan's uh, big number of students. So this tells us that this paragraph will be about where Taiwanese students go to study abroad. So these two paragraphs are very interesting. Paragraph four about Taiwanese students it makes sense because we are in Taiwan. We generally care more about what's going on in Taiwan. But paragraph three is about the United States. We're not in the United States, so why should we care? Why is the entire paragraph about this country? And uh, we may have some ideas. Maybe because the US is the most popular place to study abroad. So no matter what country you are from, there is a higher chance that you will choose to study in the US than in another country. So this information is like is more likely to be important for more readers. And there's another way to think about this information. It could be assuming that you, if you want to study abroad, you would want to go to the US. This is a different way of looking at it. The first way is most people choose the US. So it's very descriptive, objective. But the second way is the author thinks that you, the reader, are likely to want to go to the US. This is more subjective, it's the writer trying to understand the reader. And uh, why would the writer assume that you would want to study in the US? Again, there are many possible reasons. One, this is written in English. And so if you want to study abroad, maybe you would choose an English language country. And if you choose an English language country, uh, the US is the most popular choice, uh, mainly for reasons of politics and economy and imperialism, uh, but we're, we don't have to talk about that much. Let's continue. Paragraph five, uh, line 22. This is a very short paragraph. The most popular majors, 主修科目, for foreign students in the US, business and management, engineering, blah, blah, blah. So this one paragraph is only about one thing. 
when students study in the US, what do they like to study? Now, this paragraph is about students who go to the US, so it fits more with paragraph three, which is also about students who go to the US. So why is this information presented in two different paragraphs? Why is paragraph four about Taiwan and then we jump back to talking about the US? Well, it's because the structure of this essay is not just focused on the content, the information. It's also focused on what the reader might want to know first. So when the reader reads paragraph three, India, China, Korea, where students come from when they study in the US, the author thinks that maybe the reader, the Taiwanese reader, will be interested in where Taiwanese students go. Uh, but when they get to paragraph five, there is more information that the writer wants to give the reader. Mainly, what do students study in the US? And after reading paragraph five, the reader might be interested in um, what students who come to Taiwan might study or would want to study. So the organizing idea is not by country, first US, then Taiwan. It's uh, by the kind of information that the reader may be interested in next. So paragraph six, in addition to overseas Chinese attending programs in Taiwan, this paragraph is about what students come to Taiwan and when they come to Taiwan, what do they study? The structure of this paragraph is also quite interesting. It starts from Chinese, then it goes to Asian, and then it goes to Western. So the order of this paragraph is from close to far. First our neighbors and then our somewhat farther neighbors and then uh, countries far away from Taiwan. When you have an essay like this full of information, it's always a good idea to put this information in some kind of order. It makes it easier for the reader to understand what you're talking about. When we read and when we listen, it's not just taking in information. We're constantly thinking about what might come up next. Uh, when you read in Chinese, this is automatic, so maybe you don't think about it. But when you read in English, you're going to have to keep reminding yourself, don't just take in information, think about what might come next. And that's how you can keep up with um, native speakers who speak English at a normal speed instead of the speed I'm using for the classroom. Let's take a short break. Uh, Okay,
Let's continue. The second to last paragraph. The first sentence says American students are also participating in study abroad programs in record numbers. So the previous paragraph is about students coming to Taiwan. And before that, we talked about students going to the US. Um, let's review. This paragraph is about students going to the US. This paragraph is about students going to Taiwan or coming to Taiwan. Uh, and this paragraph is about what students study in the US. This paragraph is about what students come to Taiwan. Uh, and so if like we draw a table, right? And we like compare what kind of information we already have and what kind of information we don't have yet. You will see that the only kind of information we don't have yet is where do American students go? So this is what the second to last paragraph is giving us. And then the last paragraph, study abroad programs provide a valuable educational opportunity. This sentence is very different from the information that we have learned in the article, right? Every other paragraph, um, except for the first paragraph, from the second paragraph, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, all of these middle paragraphs are about numbers and facts and information. But this sentence is a general idea, right? A valuable opportunity. So this tells us that this is the conclusion. Um, when you have a textbook in front of you, you of course know when the article will end. But if you are looking at the article on a computer, like right now, and you only look to here, you don't yet know if this is the last paragraph. But when you read the first sentence with its general idea, it already tells you that something is changing. This is no longer about the facts and the information. And so, it's very likely that this paragraph is the last paragraph. And indeed, you see the author at the very end, so this is the last paragraph. So the writing strategy of this article is that the first paragraph, the introduction, and the last paragraph, the conclusion, give you general ideas. And the middle paragraphs give you hard numbers. The general ideas in the first paragraph prepare you to think about the different ways that we can measure studying abroad, right? Uh, where, where, what do students study? Where do they come from? Where do they go? What are the details about the US? What are the details about Taiwan? Different ways to look at this information. The introduction prepares us for this kind of logic because the introduction also says there are many different ways to look at studying abroad, right? Different kinds of people, different things to study. So even though the first paragraph does not give you hard facts and numbers, the logic of this first paragraph is the same as the logic for the rest of the article to give you different sides of this big piece of information. So you can see that a good introduction doesn't just tell you the topic, it also prepares you 
for the logic of the article. It helps prepare you to take in and understand the information of the article. The conclusion uh, does the opposite. This article, the logic is separation, Fenli, right? First, this kind of information, then that kind of information. But by the conclusion, you have to bring all of this together to let the reader feel like they understand what you have told them. Now, I'm pretty sure that nobody can remember all of these numbers after reading it only one time. But because the conclusion brings everything back together, it makes the reader feel like they understand this article. And that is a very important job of a conclusion. Uh, right, it says study abroad programs provide a valuable educational opportunity uh, and people can also do this and also do that. Right, also, so not either or one or the other, but also together. And then it uses words like. Do more. Right, so this is also adding things. It's not separating, it's adding. And finally, it mentions the future. This is also very important for a conclusion. Why did the reader read this? What can they do with this information? A good conclusion will show the reader how to use this information in the future. The idea of going into the future. Um, so this paragraph is trying to give the reader the idea that. OK, you have read the article, you know more about studying abroad. So you can consider uh, whether you want to do this. Uh, and you can think about how studying abroad can affect the world. Right, it says. Future relationships between countries, so basically the world. It pushes the reader toward the future. It shows them the importance of this information. So that is the general writing strategy of this article. Do you have questions? Writing is like a game. Uh, if we don't consider literature, right? Information uh, based articles, things you read for information are like games. There are only uh, a few number of ways that an article can be structured. So if you look at each article and you observe the structure, the more you read, the more familiar these structures will be. And so in the future, for example, when you're taking a test, when you start to read an article and you understand which structure it is using, you can much more easily understand the content of the article. Uh, just like if you play chess, Xia Xi Yang Qi, if you know the common strategies, then when you play a new opponent, when you play a new player, and they use one of those strategies, you are already more prepared to try to beat them. The same thing for reading English. The more familiar with these common strategies that you are, the more prepared you will be to defeat the test. And also for general reading ability, also very important. OK, so we have read through once for the general idea. We have read through a second time for the writing strategy. 
Now let's go in detail for the words and the grammar. And then after that, I will. I, I think there's a recording so we can listen to uh, how a native speaker would read this uh, article at a normal speed as a kind of practice for your listening. OK, grammar again, starting from the title study abroad. In Chinese, we know this idea, right? But notice the grammar. Is study a, a noun or a verb? As it means, has it don't see. This is the more you read, the more confusing this becomes, right? Studying abroad. In this case, it uses the ing. But then here it says, can study abroad. So study is a verb again. And here it says university study. So study becomes a noun again. So like, how do we understand the grammar of this word study? Thinking about this question reveals a deep, dark secret about English grammar. Uh, when you were learning grammar, your English teacher probably told you something like nouns are person, thing, idea, something like that, right? And verbs are actions, things that you do. That's not exactly true. When you learn math, first the teacher teaches you about uh, whole numbers, 整数, right? And then the teacher introduces natural numbers, 自然数, and then you get negative numbers, 复数, and then you get like uh, fractions, 分数, and then you get like imaginary numbers, 实数. So uh, the the idea of that kind of teaching is you you don't want the student to be confused from the very beginning. So you start with a uh, with an easier idea, and then you add things and you modify things so to slowly to give the student the complete picture. We do something similar in English. We tell you first nouns are things and people and ideas verbs are actions but really the actual definition of a noun is any word that you put in the position of a subject uh, so like in chinese we have something called ping. Right, In English, this is the basic situation. Words are not defined by are they a noun or are they a verb. It, the words are defined by the position in the sentence. So the answer to what is study, is it a noun or a verb? The answer is it depends on the sentence. So in this, uh, this sentence, can study abroad, study is a verb. In this sentence, the most popular type of study abroad, study is a noun. And the idea I want to tell you is don't panic. It does not mean that you can never be sure of is this a noun or a verb. It means that you can always be sure because when you read the sentence, the structure of the sentence will tell you. So, OK, so let's look closely at the first paragraph. Uh, studying abroad can mean many things to many different people. In this 
phrase. It can mean many things to many different people. The word different is unnecessary. It's redundant. It's you can also say many different things to many different people, but you don't need to emphasize different. The, the whole reason you say the word many is because they are different people, right? Uh, so the more common phrase is simply, it can mean many things to many people. Generally, or in general, so uh, we think of studying abroad as something. To think of A as B, uh, by A Shangchen B by A Sui B. But also uh, sometimes instead of think, you will use the word consider. Right? I consider A. The correct uh, grammar is to consider A to be B. If you say to consider A as B, it means something different. Uh, to consider A as B means when you think about A, you think about it in terms of A is a kind of B. Uh, let's let's uh, give an example. Uh, to think of your teacher as an English teacher means that when you think about your teacher, you try to imagine your teacher as an English teacher. But if you say to consider your teacher as an English teacher, it means you know that your teacher is an English teacher before you begin thinking about your teacher. Uh, 就是那个逻辑关系刚好前后相反, 用think的话就是把A看作B, 但是用consider as的话就是已知B是这样的类型, 然后你再去思考它, um, so if you want to use the easier sentence structure uh, by A to B to think of A as B, please use to consider A to be B by A to B. Um, OK, continuing the end of the second line, business people. Uh, this is the more polite gender neutral way of talking about people who do business as uh, a of course you have businessmen business women and by the same logic you will also sometimes see the word business people one word business person business people okay here Business people, families, teenagers, and married couples. A, B, C, and D. So my question is, before the and, should there be a comma? If you think yes, raise your hand. If you think no, raise your hand. Ah, you have no idea. OK. Um, here's the thing. People disagree. English grammar and English usage is defined by how native speakers use the language. This logic is very different from Chinese. In, in Chinese, we have correct usage 正确用法. and this correct usage is defined by i don't know i'm not quite sure but there is a group of scholars who define what is correct usage the same thing in france in france they have a group of scholars who define what is correct french what is incorrect french in english it's the opposite Nobody defines what is correct or not. 
Do you know how they write English dictionaries? Chinese dictionaries, Hai. Again, a group of scholars figure out what is right, what is wrong, and they write the book. English dictionaries, the writers will look at how people actually use the language online, in books. Uh, volunteers will send examples to the dictionary writers. And from all of that information, the dictionary writers will uh, uh, inductively observe and conclude what does this word mean. So the true decision about what is the correct way to use English is not according to the dictionary. It's according to how native speakers actually use the language. Dictionaries are always one step behind because they have to collect the information and figure out how to write the meaning. It's always a little bit out of date. So back to this grammar question, comma or no comma? It depends on what a native speaker will decide. And currently the trend is that in American English, yes comma. In British English, no comma. Uh, but this is one of the weaker grammar rules. For both Americans and English people, there are native speakers who do the opposite. But in general, American English, yes, British English, no. But if you think about this using logic, it makes much more sense to add a comma. Sometimes when you make a list, some things in that list will actually be more than one thing. Um, let's see if I can think of an example. Uh, for example, if I'm asking my girlfriend to go out and buy some things, I might say, uh, can you go out and first of all, I don't have a girlfriend. This is just an example. I don't have a boyfriend either. Uh, so if uh, when you go out, please buy milk and eggs, uh, a light bulb, Paul, and some screws, uh, and also uh, some paint for the outside of the house. So it's three, it's it's seven things, but it's three groups of things. So within each item will appear the word and, right? Milk and eggs, light bulb and screws. So if you don't have a comma before the last and, you can't tell whether the last two things should be different groups or the same group. And now in this example, it doesn't really matter, right? As long as my girlfriend buys everything, it's fine. But sometimes it does matter. And if you don't have a comma there, it can be confusing. So it's I personally, as someone who learned American English, believe that you should always add a comma before the last item in a list. Almost anyone in any age group. Uh, sometimes we will say in, sometimes we will say of. Of here would mean belonging to. So anyone in any age group or anyone of any age group. The most popular and well known. Um, so. In this case, it's two things combined into one thing. Most popular, most well known. But in fact, instead of saying most well known, you can simply say best known. Uh, 
well, better, best. It's just like the word good. Good, better, best, well, better, best. So you can also say the most popular and best known type of study abroad. The word type is also very interesting. In Chinese, we, we usually translate this as leixing. And you, if there, some similar words include kind, right? What kind of, what type of, uh, and sometimes you will also see what sort of. But these three words generally just mean a category, leixing, but they come from different origins. Type, uh, as you might guess from like typing on a keyboard, type comes from the printing press, ying shua, ji shu. So a type is the thing that makes the mark on the page. So uh, when they like create the thing to print, they actually have to make the letter, right? And for different kinds of fonts, 不同的字形, each font, each letter will be its own little square. And so the idea is it's very clear whether it is this letter or that letter, this font or that font. It's separated very clearly. The word kind comes from uh, genealogy, sheep. Uh, kind means family or family relation. So the idea here is that things of the same kind are related to each other. Uh, so the idea of being exactly the same is weaker than if you use the word type, right? Each letter of each type is unique and exactly the same, but different members of the same family are slightly different. The third word is sort. The word sort means to arrange into categories. So really the meaning of the word sort, when we say the sort of, is this is how we put them into one category. It's not for any reason. It's just the way that we have decided to do this. So like type and kind are based on some kind of logic, but sort is simply a result. In English, no two words are exactly the same. There's always a little difference. So the little difference between type, kind, and sort is that type is a more strict and rigid uh, separation. Kind is a bit looser, is not as strict. And sort does not need a logic. It is simply the result of somebody creating a category. In daily life, uh, you can generally understand all three of these words. But for a native speaker, the, the meaning, the feeling of these three words is a little different. Does that make sense? Um, when we learn English words, English teachers like myself, we love to talk about the history of words. And this is because the history is carried in the words themselves. When native speakers use English words, they may not know the history of the word, but that history affects the feeling of the word. If you use a word that means the same thing, but it comes from a different history, a native speaker will tell you it feels a little different. And sometimes that little difference uh, for a native speaker would mean that you're using the wrong word. Uh, so it's always uh, interesting and sometimes important to learn about the history of words. This word, sports, 
体育运动 In British English, there's no S. It's simply sport. Uh, so in, in American English, we say, do you like to play sports? In British English, they say, do you enjoy sports? No S. Here in line six, there's supposed to be the word and here. A, B, and, even C. Um, but many native speakers, uh, because they already have the word even, will forget to put the and there. The meaning is the same, right? The and tells you this is the last thing. The word even, 甚至, also tells you it's the last thing, but the grammar is not exactly uh, the same. So that's something that you should pay attention to. If you take a test and you have to write this kind of sentence and the person marking your test uh, cares a lot about this kind of thing, they may mark this as a mistake. So it's always good to know about this kind of thing. And then the last sentence, there's something for everyone. This is also a common phrase, just like it means many things to many people. There's something for everyone. There are many different options, so different people can choose what they want. There's something for everyone. Uh, OK, so the next period we have to move to. What was it? CC 406. Um, so let's end early and I'll give you time to move around, go to the restroom and I'll meet you there at um, 11.10. Okay, let's continue. We just finished the first paragraph. Paragraph two. Line seven, this number, 586,323. Um, so, of course, the common question is, how do I remember how to say the numbers? Um, and this is why the numbers are divided into groups of three with the common. Every time you have a one, you change the name of the number. Right, so this is 6,000. If you have another comma, then it becomes, for example, 1 million. And everything in the middle is hundreds, uh, tens, and ones. Uh, if you want to translate from Chinese, you can use the same principles. Remember uh, numbers that are easy to convert. And then adjust from those numbers. So you can remember 1,000 equals 10, uh, and then 1 is 10,000, and then E is, uh, Sorry, I, you may do this from English. So, uh, thousand is ten, ten thousand. Uh, sorry, thousand is ten. Million is by one. Billion, which is two commas. Three commas. Billion is three commas. I just wish you is the e. And trillion is solid, four commas. And so, if you remember these numbers, uh, Thousand is chess, million is by one, billion is three, and trillion is solid. Then when you see a number and you want to translate from Chinese to English, you can then adjust uh, from these specific numbers. Um, the other thing to remember is if your number 
Um, when you read a number in English, some people will add the word and to the very end, like 300 and 23. Um, but really, the correct way is not to add and. Simply read the numbers uh, normally. Even when you have a number with zero, like this number, 28,017. You just continue and you skip the parts with zeros. Uh, or this number also. 179,093. You just skip the zeros. Okay, let's go back to line eight. There are approximately this many foreign students enrolled in American universities and colleges. So the word enrolled in Chinese, we uh, translate this as 就学. Another word that you might see here is registered, which means 注册. There's a little difference between these two. If you are enrolled, you must be registered. If you are actively taking classes, if you are enrolled, you have to be registered. But you can be registered and not take any classes. So you can be registered but not enrolled. Uh, and this sometimes makes a little difference when you want to count how many students. The definition can be a little different. Uh, there may be a situation where there are many students who are registered, but uh, many of them are not taking classes. And so the number of registered students would be different from the number of enrolled students. There will be much fewer enrolled students than registered students. Uh, and again, we can think about this difference from the origin of the word, from the history of the word. Enrolled, the beginning, E-N. In Chinese, I often like to say this is sama sama part. Becoming role. So what is a role? Uh, a role today we would say a role of toilet paper, or a role of um, kitchen wipes. As an e trend that more don't. This comes from in the Middle Ages, some city, um, when the king wanted to. Uh, we uh, wanted somebody to spread the news or to give an announcement, or the, the king needed to call people to join the army. The king would send out messengers, uh, and the messengers would have a roll of paper or a roll of parchment, and on that roll would be listed the information or the list of names that the king wanted to join the army. So a roll of paper with people's names on it then became a list of names. So to be enrolled means to be part, to become part of the list of names, to join the list of names. And here, the list of names is the list of people taking a class. This is why to, uh, when a teacher wants to find out which students are in the class and which students are absent, to translate called me. In English, it's called to take the role or to call the role or to do the role call. So the teacher is calling names off of the list of names. The other word, register, uh, registration, register, comes from the word registry, 
in Chinese it is Lu, Lu. So usually a registry is a, a kind of information storage. It's not to be used every day. It's a database. If you need to find out uh, the names of a group of people, then you would look at the registry. So it's uh, like backup information. So if you look at these two words like this, then enrolled is on the list of names for a class. So these are students who are actively taking a class. Registered are the students who are on the list of student names for the school uh, as a kind of backup information to the two service. Okay, in the same sentence, you have American universities and colleges. What's the difference between these two words, university and college? Uh, well, when you look at the English website for our school, you have things like the College of uh, Art and Design, the College of Tourism and Language. But all of these colleges are part of the same university, Ming Chuan University. So you can think of a college as a group of related fields or a group of related subjects. Uh, and because these different fields or different majors to show um, are so similar, it's easier to manage them together. So they combine into a college. A university is a group of colleges. Uh, and so a university will include many different kinds of majors and many different kinds of colleges. Um, in the beginning, the word college used to mean uh, what the word faculty means today. Faculty in Chinese is twenty thousand. Uh, so when the university was first born in the late Middle Ages, uh, the word college simply meant a group of teachers who taught similar things. And that's why uh, the related word colleague means people who work together. Um, but as universities and colleges grew bigger, it became not just teachers, but also like administration, right, resources, support, uh, and it became the kind of school that we have today. You will notice that university, this word looks like universe. So, and indeed, the word university, uh, if you if you look at the different parts of this word, uni means one. One, two, three, that's like one. Verse originally means speaking. To speak, to talk. So a university is where all of these different majors and disciplines and teachers talk with the same voice. So they are part of the same group. Uh, so you can tell that in a university, there is more difference inside the university, and there is less difference inside the college. Uh, so that can help you remember that universities are usually bigger than colleges. Even today, especially in the West, there are some colleges that don't belong to universities. Uh, I can't quite think of an example, but sometimes you will hear a school called blah blah blah, 
Uh, and so the English name of that school would be Dalaran College. And it will not belong to a bigger university. It will itself be an independent school. The last thing I want to say about these two words is the grammar. You study in college, but you study at university. In college, at university. There's a detailed reason and feeling behind this difference. Um, as we said, college is more about similar ideas, similar groups of teachers. So when you study in college, you are part of a group of people that are the same. But when you study at university, it is simply saying which school you go to. There is no uh, foundation of a group of similar people. It's simply a place. So where are you? I am at university, but you are in college. Okay, next thing, the 2002-2003 academic year. First, let's look at the numbers, 2002. Um, usually in English, when we say a year, we will split the word into two halves. For example, the year we would say 1999. It's two halves, first 19, then 99. The same thing for this year, 2022. First 20, then 22. But if the second half of the number begins with zero, uh, there are two different ways we would say this. The first way is like here. You just read the number, 2002, 2003. But if uh, it's not a, a number that is 1,000, like 1,002, 1,003, if you have a number like uh, each of examples, you would still split it into two caps. You would say 19, O three, not zero three, O three, nineteen O three. So if you want to talk about the year thirty eighteen, you would say twenty one O seven. The other thing I want to say here is that this is the wrong punctuation mark. I've got in soils. The correct punctuation mark is a dash or a hyphen. This one. So it should be 2002 dash 2003. The slash means you choose one or the other. But the hyphen, this one, connects two numbers. So it's both numbers. When you think about an academic year, you don't choose one year or the other year. It's both years. So the middle should be a hyphen or a dash, not a slash. Okay, next slide. Another number. How do you read this kind of number? Zero. Point six. So in media, you know, we say point zero point six. Percent. I can be. Now, in speaking of these kinds of numbers, uh, should this number be a singular or a plural? I have the answer as a function. If you have a verb, should this be singular or plural? Standard. 
In English, the answer is plural, fusu. In English, only one number is singular. One. Every other number is plural. Even if it's less than one, it's still plural. Even if it's zero, zero point zero 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 zero, it's also plural. You can say uh, zero people went to the movie theater that night. Then you want some very interesting In English, that is zero people. Only one is one person. Okay. Um, this, you will notice this space is incredibly big. Um, in fact, once you see this space and you look at the other spaces between sentences, these spaces all look very big. This is because in the old days, uh, English teachers would say, after you finish a sentence, type two spaces. We don't use this any Um There's no real reason to add two spaces. We all know when a sentence ends. Uh, but if you see this kind of thing, it's not a mistake. It's just an older rule of typing in English. But this is a good chance to remind you when you type in English, the punctuation mark, is like another letter. Um, in Chinese, punctuation marks are their own character. But in English, they are just another letter. So, for example, Notice this sentence. So, comma, space. There's no space before the comma. The comma is another letter that you add to the word so. Right, so so, comma, and then a space between two words. Same thing with the period. The word, no space, period, because the period is part of this word. And then a space. But look at this quotation mark to the entire. This is different. It's first a space, then a quotation mark, and then no space. This is because you are quoting the word in the middle. So these two quotation marks both belong to the word in the middle. They are both part of this word. So you would put the space between the first quotation mark and the earlier word. Q. And if you continue, you would put the space between the second quotation mark and the next word. Um, a lot of Taiwanese students, when they type English, they don't know that this is a rule. Uh, every English article you read will follow these rules. So it's good to pay attention, not just uh, when you read, it's good to pay attention to the information, but also you should pay attention to how the information is presented. 
That way you will notice this kind of move. Uh, and since we're talking about punctuation, notice that this period is inside the quotation mark. In American English, if a sentence ends with a period and a quotation mark, the period always goes inside the quotation mark. If uh, instead of a period, you have a comma, the comma always goes inside the quotation mark. But in British English, the rule is different. In British English, it depends on your meaning. In the meaning of the sentence, uh, the period does not belong to the quotation, then you put it outside the quotation mark. If the comma does not belong to the quotation, you put it outside the quotation mark. What does that mean? Does it belong? Here, I am quoting one word, correct? So there's no question of punctuation. So the comma or the period will be outside. But if I'm quoting a sentence, or if I'm quoting part of a sentence, then sometimes, according to the logic of that sentence inside the quotation, it might need a period at the end, it might need a comma at the end. Um, so you can see that the American system is much easier. Just put it inside. No question. Okay. Um, in the United States, so the United States, America, and then here you have U.S. U dot S dot, and then here you have U.S. No dots. Four different ways of talking about the same country. Very strange. Um, there are actually only uh, two ways or three ways. You can say America, right here. You can say the, or sorry, the United States. Remember, you have to add the the. Um, even though it's a maze, it still has to follow grammar. What are these states? Did you, a state here in Chinese is like Zhenquan, is it uh, In America, every state is considered a sovereign country. Uh, so every American state has its own constitution, its own court system, its own highest court, uh, and these, uh, e for each state, this system is used for things that only concern one state. It's only when you have things concerning more than one state that you would use American law and American rules. So, because each state is considered its own kind of country, that's why the, the entire country is called the United States. What are these states? They are the United States. So, that's why you have the the, this group of United States. So, the word the is part of the country's name.
Um, and we can also talk about the word the. Sometimes you say the, sometimes you say the. And the rule here is if the next word begins with a vowel, you would say the. But if the next word begins with a consonant, you would say the. So, for example, da qi cen, the atmosphere begins with an A, so you would say the atmosphere. But notice, I just said the United States. Isn't you a vowel? Why am I saying the? Because this rule is not about spelling, how this contains it. This rule is about pronunciation, fine. When you say United States, the first sound is actually the sound of a Y. Like, yes, right? United, yes. It's a Y sound. And the Y sound is a consonant, as you can see. Like, so in this case, you would say it's the United States. The other way to, the third way to talk about this country is the U.S. You can choose to use no dots. You can choose to use dots. But please choose only one. Don't use both. There's no reason to use both. Um, in this case, this example, U.S. is used as an adjective. Actually, it's a Chinese word. U.S. International Student Enrollment. 美国国际学生入学率。So in this case, U.S. is a kind of international student. So there's no the, right? It's just U.S. There's no the U.S. But here, U.S. is used as a noun. It's a place. Uh, so you say the U.S. right here, the U.S. Uh, okay. This trend reflects. Have uh, fun. This is not a shenyang. Uh, this, the logic of this word is exactly the same in Chinese and in English. As long as you remember to use the correct word in Chinese. Right? Since it's in, I think. In, uh, in, 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 in. Uh, so in both cases, it's like a mirror. Shenqing is the like search it out by me. And what it means is that it is due to uh, the following reasons. And here the sentence gives us reasons of globalization, control fall, and interdependence between countries and economies. Inter means between, zijianlin. Right? Independence is to be. Independence. But interdependence is the opposite. It means that they are not separate. You have to think about them together. Now, this grammar is a little bit confusing. Interdependence between A and B. Does this mean that A and B are connected? Or does this mean that different kinds of A are connected and different kinds of B are connected? The grammar is not clear. For both ideas, it's the same grammar. But if you look at the meaning of the sentence, it is clear that it is between different kinds of countries and different kinds of economies. So this is combining two sentences, interdependence between countries and interdependence between economies. 
I mean, because the two sentences are very similar, the author combined these two. Creating confusion. So when you write English, uh, this is one of the harder parts of writing in English, is noticing if your sentence can be confusing. If the reader may be able to understand your sentence in more than one way. What we write, we have an idea, we think of a way to say that idea, and then we write it down on paper. This process from our brain to the paper is one way as dictionaries. So it's actually very hard to catch your own mistakes. To catch a mistake, you have to go in the opposite direction. When a reader reads this thing on the paper, what will the reader think? It's in the opposite direction. And that's why it's so hard to catch mistakes in your own writing. When you examine your own writing, mostly what people do is they check whether the thing on the paper is what they wanted to put on the paper. Most people don't think about is the thing on the paper what I wanted to say. Uh, but only the second kind can help you uh, catch mistakes because you have to pretend like you are a different person. You're the reader. The reader doesn't know what you want to say until they read the thing. So you have to pretend like you don't know what you want to say until you read what you have written. And that's very hard to do. And that's why it takes practice to try to catch your own mistakes. Um, and this word, economies. Economy, meaning we think it is a word that you cannot count. Right? The economy, GDP. But here, the word countries gives us a hint. Different countries, different economies. So here, the word economy is not the global economy. It is not different kinds of economy, like capitalism, communism, socialism, that's not what this means. Here, economies is talking about the economy of each country. When a country thinks about its own economy, uh, and then you have different countries, therefore you can have different economies. Um, just like for different parts of English grammar, how can you tell if a noun can be counted or not? It depends on what kind of meaning you want to use. Every countable noun can be uncountable if you want to use an abstract meaning. For example, how do you go to school? By car. The word car should be countable, but if you say by car, you're using the uncountable version of this word. Because you're not saying I use this car or that car. You're not saying I use one car or two cars. You're saying the kind of way I get to school is by using the kind of thing called a car. So it's an abstract word. 
It's a type of thing. It's not a thing that you would count. So in this way, you can turn uncountable, I'm uh, sorry, you can turn countable counts into uncountable counts. The same logic explains why here the uncountable noun economy is used as a countable noun because it is used in connection with different countries. So you can count countries and each country has its own economy. You can therefore count economies. Continuing, in addition to something, remember that after this, it is always a noun. In addition to, uh, in addition to video games, I also like exercise. Both are nouns. So here, wanting an international education to meet future professional demands and opportunities is one thing. So in addition to A, students also did B. So what is this? Wanting an international education to here in order to with and not all. Uh, with and then meet is uh, to meet demands. But demands is a kind of request, something that other people want from you. So when other people want something from you, you can satisfy that demand. You can also meet that demand. Uh, but in this case, the word opportunities is using the wrong grammar. You cannot meet opportunities. You can grab opportunities, draw to which you wish. You can use opportunities. You can take advantage of opportunities, such as you will. But you cannot meet opportunities. This is lazy writing. The author wanted to combine two sentences, uh, but you can't combine them because the verb is different. Uh, and then in line 13, to gain an understanding of something. Uh, it just means to understand something. Um, but sometimes people like to turn the verbs into terms for no good reason. So when you see something like this, uh, pay attention to the verb that is used to gain an understanding. It's a set phrase, to gain an understanding. Uh, and if you don't want to get an understanding, if you want to say that you already understand, you would say that you have an understanding. You have a good understanding of something. Uh, so here I have a great understanding of other cultures. Uh, okay, so let's stop here. We will continue next week.